G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that wonderful podcast that nobody in the world really cares about except us. And of course, we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and Australian sci-fi fandom, which is a particularly cool topic. And my co-host is just so cool. Did you know he once tried to sell his special sci-fi t-shirt collection with the sweat stains under the armpits? Yes, it's welcome, Jeff Rowe! <laughs> Hey, Dags, and believe it or not, uh, it's actually sadly all true because I did have a great washing machine, and what can I say? It's like when they say comes as is, uh, it was certainly as is. Well, you got to remember, dude, to get a washing machine to work, you've actually got to physically plug it in and connect the water. Just having it sit there, still in the box, mint in box for a washing machine, isn't going to get the clothes clean. <laughs> i got to leave them a uh, memento that counts, and, and believe me, it probably counted. So uh, we're going to be uh, dropping some classic uh, Jeffro nerd facts at the start of every episode that's coming up. And if you want to know more about those nerd facts about the Jeffro, uh, believe it or not, if you do actually Google the Jeffro page, um, he'll actually pop up. So uh, there's actually a website devoted to the Jeffro. <laughs> and it's full of wonderful bits of trivia. You're going to absolutely love it, which is very, very cool. What do you reckon, Jeffro? Actually, I was looking at it the other day and my uh, work blocked it, so I don't know what was wrong with it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's definitely worth blocking. But anyway, let's get on with the show because we have lots to talk about. And as per what we had last time, we do actually have uh, letters of comment coming through. So people actually do love us enough to actually write in some particular interesting letters. So Jeffro, who has written in tonight and what have they got to talk about? Well, we have this wonderful letter from um, a gentleman by the name of uh, MJ Fuchs, I think it is. So um, MJ uh, has written, Dear Nerds, because you've both been in the fan community for a long time, do you have any interesting convention stories worth sharing? Mm, we probably do. I'll tell you what, it's funny because, um, like as mentioned, I mean, our history goes back quite a long way. It's like for Jeffro, he's been on both a Star Trek and a Star Wars convention committee. Uh, and I've been on multiple Star Wars convention committees along with other committees that we've both been a part of as well. So it's kind of interesting because when you get asked that question about amusing stories, you have to really rack your brains because you're talking about decades worth of events and things that had occurred with them. And um, you and I have both sort of compiled a small list of bits and pieces, but uh, I'm going to kick off with uh, something that you've got first from uh, your days in the past. Well, I remember, and this dates back to the uh, the nineties when we had the television show Beauty and the Beast uh, with Ron Perlman, and uh, actually, probably one of my more elaborate costumes was to do the Beast, and I enlisted a uh, a friend who was in the uh, effects industry to do uh, a latex uh, prosthetic on the uh, the face, and I went to a uh, costume shop and uh, I bought myself a uh, wig, and. Uh, we went on stage and uh, everyone was really amazed and fascinated by it all. But the interesting thing is that uh, even though I'm six foot three and sort of uh, one of the more taller people in the community, uh, a lot of people going, I don't know who that is. Who is that? Because I deliberately left my name out and, uh, and people coming up. And uh, one of the classics that will make you laugh is uh, as someone go, who are you? And I said, I'm Batman. So I couldn't resist uh, using that line. And really, um, uh, I, no one actually sort of figured it out until I confessed it up because they really just couldn't guess past the makeup um, appliance and the uh, the wig. Yeah, I can attest to seeing you on uh, stage with that. And it looked fantastic because all your previous costumes had always been done as a bit of a joke. And this time you did something seriously. And uh, I was very impressed. And, of course, that wig ended up getting used again uh, for when we were doing a, a Doctor Who 30th anniversary video tribute thing, uh, which was a takeoff of Wayne's World called Jeff's World <laughs> that a friend of ours, Russell, filmed. Uh, and I ended up wearing the wig, so I got to uh, savour a bit of Jeffro DNA on my own snoggin, which was particularly cool. So, oh, my goodness gracious me. Uh, that was actually very, very grimy. Um, for myself, there's actually quite a few that I had to sort of think about, and I go, well, okay, it's about amusing and memorable moments. And uh, I guess one of the funny things was that in uh, 1997, we had a convention called Force 2, uh, which was a big Star Wars convention. It was a massive event uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of Star Wars. And, of course, this doesn't happen today, but um, one of the good things about conventions of our era wasn't just what happened during the daytime, but what happened at nighttime, because um, people would be staying in the hotel 
rooms at the venue and of course there'd be room parties everywhere and in a lot of occasions the doors would just be open and people just coming and going at will and we had the entire hotel uh, venue to ourselves and it was such a cool thing that even the guests to the convention actually joined us that was like people like kenny baker who played r2d2 and steve sansweet who was the world's biggest star wars collector even they joined us uh, for those parties and there are photographs from those uh, particular nights and they're the kind of thing that no matter how well you try and describe how great they were unless you were there you just wouldn't have an idea of what it was about because that sort of stuff just does not happen anymore at modern events and uh, i know you jeffrey you've been to a lot of uh, room parties in your time yeah I mean, that was the thing. I mean, fandom back in the 80s and 90s it was all about being social. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So, uh, and another one I just want to chuck in there, this one I had to think about, and I go, oh, my God, I forgot this happened. In 2005, believe it or not, I can attest, of all the things that I've done in my fandom career, and there's a lot of things I can go, oh, I'm pretty proud of, and I uh, reckon no one else has done this. I once had a wrestling match with a con guest, uh, and I don't even know how this even happened. So it was at uh, Force 4 in 2005. So the actress who played Sly Moore from Revenge of the Sith, uh, the actress's name was Sandy Finlay, was sitting on a couch. And for whatever reason, we got into a wrestling match. It was a fun one. It wasn't, like, aggressive or anything. I thought, who gets the job of saying to people later on, it's like, yeah, it doesn't, I don't care how many guests you've sort of, like, minded or looked after or cared for, but how many of them we actually had a wrestling match with on a couch? <laughs> I can put my hand up for that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 who who won the uh, the pin in the end? Who won? Oh, I think she did actually. She was on top of me, and I tell you, what, she was quite strong. So uh, it was like, oh my god! And I thought about it afterwards. I was like, how did that even happen? Where did that even start from? So it was this kind of bizarre. So that was something I have to put down as uh, being an amusing sort of like um, memory. Talking about uh, conventions and stuff. I mean, costume parades are a really big thing in um, in the conventions now. It's called cosplay, but we used to call them uh, costume parades and. I found that uh, it's interesting that if you choose a particular um, uh, costume to to do, make sure that it's something that people know because there was uh, someone that did a really nice costume and it was based on a, uh, a comic book character. And this is a, uh, a convention primarily for, you know, movies and uh, TV show uh, fans and all that. So uh, they didn't recognise that it was the, uh, the character Dr. Fate and all we could get was some person going, it's Chicken Man. And then <laughs> next thing you know, everyone's going, it's Chicken Man. It's Chicken Man. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. So <laughs> it, it really does help to pick um, pick pick your character. So uh, forever, <laughs> that sort of stuck. Yeah, um, that was really uh, sad. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a bit unfortunate. I do remember that one. Uh, we're not going to mention the person who wore it. It was a bit no. of a, a sad moment for him. But you are right. Nobody knew who it was. And I've actually seen that a few times at events where someone is so ahead of the game, they'll see a, uh, an outfit or a costume in an upcoming show or movie. They make the outfit for it. They turn up. And, in fact, at that same convention, someone else turned up wearing a costume from a show that hadn't been released yet or wasn't in this country. And people go, who the hell are you? And, uh, yeah, it was actually – it can be a risk if you're uh, too ahead of the game. And, um, yeah, that does actually happen, unfortunately. So, But, uh, yeah, it wouldn't occur now. But, yeah, at the time it certainly did. You, you weren't dobbing yourself in because I believe that you did a certain costume and you were just pretending that it was a, uh, a future Star Trek uh, television series that no one had seen yet. Well, that's actually very true because uh, there was an American convention that came out to Australia in uh, 1993 in Melbourne called Starfest, and it was the first pro-con professional convention to be run in the city, and there was like 3,000 people turned up to it. And, of course, I didn't have a Star Trek costume to wear, so I wore my V uniform. So V was the miniseries from the 1980s. And you got to remember, this was only like a seven or eight years after the show had been on, and people didn't recognise it. And I thought, how could you not know what V was? And uh, so I made a joke and said it was actually from the uh, third episode of Deep Space Nine, which at that point hadn't come out yet. And the thing was, people believed me. And you can go, okay, if one person believes it, yeah, sure, fair enough. But multiple people believed it. And I thought, how stupid can these people be? And I had one guy, I remember vividly, looking at me from across the room and it was like, he's like sizing me up. I was like, what's the deal with that? And he comes over to me and says, uh, and he's dead serious. He says, uh what's that from? And I said, me being me, I just said, oh, yeah, it's from the third episode of uh, Deep Space Nine, which hasn't come out yet. And he goes, oh, no wonder I don't recognise it. I thought, oh, my God, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that became the running jag for uh, for everybody. So I can't figure that one out at all. Um, speaking of um, uh, interesting things, back in our day, and this once again doesn't happen anymore, um, many conventions used to open up their uh, opening ceremonies with a, a video. 
Uh, so just a sort of a bit of a, a lead into the particular show. And this one in 1990 for TrekCon 4, good old Russell Devlin, who's uh, uh, one of our uh, great buddies, actually uh, created his own uh, video opening ceremony, which featured the committee. And, of course, Jeff Rowe was on the committee for that. And he got the job of having doing an arm wrestle with a toy Godzilla, where he was listed as Jeff Chili, video programmer and fearless monster fighter. <laughs> Because I did the audio for that. So uh, do you remember that? I do. And every now and then sort of someone will actually say, oh, you're Jeff Tilly, uh, <laughs> video programmer and fearless monster <laughs> fighter. <laughs> and I wear it with a badge of honour. Oh, it was funny because I had to do the – I didn't even want to know what the video even looked like. I just had to do the audio recording for it. And then I just had to put a really good vibe, fearless monster fighter. <laughs> Jeez. Well, of course, there's the uh, famous convention that uh, both you and I attended that uh, never actually existed. So yes. there was a, a, a convention that was uh, all set to go. They announced the dates. They announced the actual venue. And due to finances or, or political infighting, who knows, but it never happened. But we were there. We actually turned up at the hotel saying, we're looking forward to the convention. And they actually let us into the rooms and... Um, we uh, put up the uh, name of the convention on the whiteboard and took pictures, <laughs> and I was wearing my my t shirt and all you that. Were, so yes, it was yes. just just a lot of um, uh, giggles on that day. <laughs> yes, it was the ultimate shit stir. This was also supposed to occur in 1993. You are right. And we went to the venue. You, you had your shirt on and everything. We said, "We're here. Where's the con?" <laughs> so we turned up on the day it was meant to be occurring. Uh, it was our little little moment of uh, <laughs> madness. But uh, that's uh, that was like, oh, geez, that's 30 years ago now. 1993. It's like bloody hell. It's all just lost in the midst of time. But uh, unbelievable. Um, this one I do remember. I don't know. Yes, yeah, you would have been around for this one. So. So there was a convention, uh, there was three of them, uh, and they were called King Cons, not King Kong, mm -hmm. but King Con. Uh, the second one was in 1986, and the third one was in 1988. Uh, and uh, they used the venue in Melbourne, a small one called the Victoria Hotel. Well, in this particular occasion, I don't know if you remember this or not, um, the whole hotel was booked out. Half of it was convention attendees, and the other half was full of um, international visitors of deaf soccer players. So I do remember. What, what a mixture of worlds was that? So I think it was on the Saturday night when they had the costume parade on. All the people in costume are coming out to the foyer. All these deaf soccer players are everywhere. And uh, that was just a bizarre mixing of worlds, wasn't it? So, um, yeah. Do you remember that? I, I do, yes. That was that was uh, bizarre. But, uh, you know, uh, you you don't get to pick who you choose to be in the hotel with. So, uh, but... Yes, I do remember that. Uh, well, one of the other things I remember is that there was a convention that uh, uh, my wife and I had booked uh, a room for, and we went up to the reception and we said, can we have the uh, uh, the room key for the, the tellies? And they gave us the keys and we went in and we made ourselves comfortable and we thought, um, hang on, I'm not sure what that suitcase is doing there. That's not ours. And it turned out that it was actually... Um, friends of ours who also share the surname of Tilly. We'd actually been given their keys and gone into their room. And uh, and um, I said to my wife, well, now's a chance to actually uh, uh, raid the uh, alcohol in the mini fridge. But uh, she said, don't you dare. But uh, for a while there, uh, we were we were living the uh, the other Tilly life. And we went back and we eventually got our uh, our keys to our room. I was going to say, I thought, I thought you were going to open up the suitcases. So I was just trying their underwear and trying their clothes and see which ones fit better. <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, aye. See, it's funny because, I mean, like the conventions that we did in our time, and one day uh, we'll probably do an episode about a lot of our history because there's a lot to cover off, uh, both from an attending and an organisational point of view. And conventions in our time, they were held in different places. Some of them were held in big hotels, some of them in really small ones. There were stories of conventions that uh, uh, back in the day we used to have video programs where movies and TV shows would be shown on the TV in a room somewhere for people to watch. That's another thing that doesn't happen anymore. And one particular convention, the actual video room was an actual hotel room. So they just decked out the room full of chairs. But, of course, there was a bed in the room and uh, there would be people taking sort of turns effectively to sleep in the bed, even though videos were playing in the room would be full of people. But... Uh, um, there are things like that that you can't even begin to imagine occurring by today's standards. It was definitely an innocent time, that's for sure. And uh, there's a bit more we can cover off regarding this. But uh, anything else you wanted to bring up regarding your uh, fantastic memories of the days gone by? I mean, as you said, there's a, a lot of great memories and sort of probably uh, uh, 
too many uh, that we can probably tell. But uh, uh, there was one that uh, I it cracks me up all the time that I remember. It's like if you did a costume and your um, visibility was quite limited in what you could mm. see, they actually had people that would escort you off the stage. And that was brilliant, uh, except for one time where I was in a costume and uh, uh, and I'd done my skit and act rather than sort of exiting um, right as like I exited left and people are going, <laughs> go back, go back, go back. And I'm going, go back what? And it's like I ended up sort of swiveling around. And instead of doing a 90 degree turn, I did 45 and walked straight off the stage, plonk bang yeah there's a whole lot of stories regarding people in costumes and costume parades and the things that work and the things that don't work and people who walk out on a stage and the music doesn't start and it's everybody just standing there in silence and costumes that have their wardrobe malfunctions on stage and people who just blew the crowd away with how great their uh, items were and their, and their outfits so actually it's very funny um if you're anybody's interested in looking it up i found today uh just by accident uh, i didn't realize you have a youtube channel called v- jeffro's vhs archive and you've actually got some video footage from TrekCon 4 in 1990, so uh, including the costume parade. So I found that by uh, by chance today. So um, you're you wore the Beauty and the Beast, the Vincent thing for that, didn't you? Uh, yes, yes, I believe I did. So that should actually be there if people want to go and check that out. Remembering it was uh, over 33 years ago, so. Uh, take that into consideration we also budgets were a lot less than they are today but uh that's a very very good times and uh was really enjoyable anything else you want to say about our days being on the convention circuit sir well uh if we get a chance to tell some more stories uh here or uh later in person uh, they're always good fun absolutely fantastic so uh there you go fans so that's uh we have who we have to thank for that particular letter by the way oh that was mr mj fuchs <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you'd still remember who it was, which is very, very cool. All right, so we're going to move on to our main topic. I know everybody's sort of hanging out for this one. Uh, it's an interesting one because most people don't talk about it like the way we do. Movie franchises which have jumped the shark. Now, for those who have no idea what jumping the shark actually means, Jeffro, fill us in. What does jumping the shark actually refer to? So jumping the shark is something that uh, originally started off with the television show Happy Days, which had been running for several uh, seasons. And after a while, the ideas and creativity starts to get a bit tired. And it got to the point where they actually wrote a story where Fonzie had to water ski over a shark. And it's like the point was that can you get any lower in terms of creativity in regards to that? And, And everyone said no. So... Basically, what it means is that when the stories are getting so desperate and so low that uh, they have to resort to things like jumping the shark, and that's what it means. Yeah, and in fact, in that show, which you can actually see that on YouTube if you want to look it up, uh, good old Fonzie still wears his uh, leather jacket and everything, and uh, yeah, even some of the actors thought it's like, oh, my God, is this what the show has become? It's getting desperate and bad. And, of course, we're talking about franchises specifically. It has to be a franchise. It can't be a single movie. And there are some absolute classics of movie franchises in particular, especially pop culture ones, that started off really, really good. And then at some point they jumped the shark and became absolute rubbish. And it's sad that this occurs because in most occasions, it's actually the third film or beyond. So the third or the fourth movie where it's just gone down the gurgler. And it's like the first two stand out as being really spectacular using the example of Superman one and two or alien and aliens. And then you get to the third and fourth movie, and especially uh, either one of those two, and it's just like in the franchise, and they go terrible. And it's usually because, and you'd know this, you know, there's a cutting of budgets and new story writers, and they're just in the cash grab business, and the films become an embarrassment. So um, what uh, springs to mind for yourself, old son, when you're talking about movies that jump the shark or franchises that jump the shark and just went uh, downhill in a big way? I mean, the the one that uh, probably springs to mind is probably the uh, Alien um, uh, franchise because we we saw the brilliance of the first movie. James Cameron just spun it around and made it equally brilliant. Uh, and then we got to Alien 3, which uh, suffered a lot of production um, uh, troubles with uh, changes in writers, getting the uh, the director to, um, to, to try and get his vision across, but... The budget was being cut. So there was a lot of uh, studio uh, 
meddling in terms of making the movie and it just as soon as you looked at it you said well yeah this is purely just there because they needed a third movie and it's there's nothing there creativity wise i mean you can see there was an attempt and ironically enough if you look at the original script you can see where they were trying to go with things but um that one was definitely going from like the the a level a plus down to like c minus and it's interesting because with some movie franchise, you're thinking, okay, you get a bump on the road, you go, okay, that one was pretty crap. Maybe they can redeem themselves with the fourth movie. And, of course, Alien Resurrection was just utter shit. And it was like just a rehash of the first two movies, effectively. And it was like I think one of the things that occurs regarding the franchise issue and where the jumping in the shark occurs is that when you're standing effectively on the shoulders of giants, so your first two movies have been that big and that successful, it's almost as if you need to be told, the studios need to be told, just stop. Don't do any more. It's almost impossible to keep this going at such a high level. And with Superman 1 and 2, it was like that because after that you had Superman 3 and they made the whole thing like a comedy with Richard Pryor because he was the, the comedian who was uh, the big hit at the time. And if you were to watch something like Superman 3 and or Alien 3, they just don't match the the, the previous two movies. And you think, what, what went wrong? And it doesn't add up. And then, of course, as I said, you try to get to the fourth movie, and in Superman's case, you go Quest for Peace, and it's even worse. It's like they jumped the shark twice. And it's like, what were you guys thinking? And in that instance, we know that with Superman 4, the rights had gone off to Golan and Globus, who were renowned for his like budget cutting in a massive way. And if you were to look at Superman the movie and then go straight to Superman 4, it's almost like it, it's an embarrassment. It really, really is to see what went wrong and how did it go so wrong. And unfortunately... These are the things you can't erase from history. They're there, and they're there forever. And uh, that's why I think sometimes when a franchise is going that well, you need to stop while you're ahead. But the studios will say, nope, we need the money. Put out the rubbish. We don't care. So long as it makes the bucks back, that's all it, uh, that's all that matters. And to give you an example of that, I was looking at the uh, Aliens movies in uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So the first movie, uh, score of 98. Second movie, score of 98. The third movie, 47. And then uh, Alien uh, Four was fifty three. So, what a what a big jump in terms of um, uh, appreciation of the movies. Well, well, with Alien Three, I mean, the funny thing was, I mean, this was in Sigourney Weaver's con contract. She said she didn't want any guns at all. So you've taken the weapons out, which means you've changed the violence, and that's what made well, one of the things that made Alien such a success. Uh, you know, Newt has died. Uh, Hicks has died. You go. Well, what was the point of rescuing those guys in the first place? You're just going to kill them, and it's. One of those things that if Alien 3, as an example, was the first movie of the trilogy to be released, it may have done all right, but because he had the other two behind it, it was going to be very, very difficult to, care, uh, to sort of like make that sort of function and work. And, of course, we saw a similar thing with Terminator. So you got Terminator 1 and 2, and after Terminator 2, which by all accounts was just like one of the best sci-fi movies of the 90s, um, you get to Terminator 3, which I didn't mind. I thought, okay, I can handle it. Terminator 3 wasn't too bad. I could see where they're going with it. You had Terminator Salvation, which will set the distant future. And then they start doing the reboots, Terminator Genesis and Dark Fate. And they, they were rubbish. They were terrible. And, of course, even the actress Amelia Clark, who worked on... Genesis said, I hope they don't do any more sequels because this was really, really quite awful and they're trying to remake the original movies. And you can't do that because the, the, the originals were so good. And only afterwards when it all failed, all the people who made the movies said, oh, yes, the audience, they don't want reboots and remakes and reimaginings. They think Hollywood's sort of running out of ideas. Like, well, if you had known that in the first place, why'd you make the frigging thing? So... And then, of course, Dark Fate comes out, and it's just as bad, you know, even with Linda uh, Hamilton in it. So uh, it's a studio thing. I get it, but it just ruins really good franchises. So uh, what started off so well for all these things, they just get worse and worse. So, yeah. And to with just give you a bit of an idea in terms of how Rotten Tomatoes actually scored the uh, Terminator franchise, uh, the first one got 100%. Uh, second one got 91%. The third one we talked about, you know, it wasn't quite as good, but, I mean, how are you supposed to reach those lofty heights? 69%. And then we get to uh, Terminator Salvation, 33%. Mm. I mean, what what a low score after that. And then, of course, they could never recover. So uh, we had uh, Genesis uh, at 26%. Yeah, and, there you go. And, and eventually uh, when Cameron came, came on... Uh, 
Dark Fate uh, got 70, which is which is not bad, certainly when you can look at uh, 33 and 26% in terms of the last two movies. Yeah, I think so. That was probably a bit of a charity because uh, it's, you, you know, when you sort of think, oh, okay, well, the next movie's coming along. The last one was terrible. Maybe this one will redeem themselves. And you get like the first 20, 30 minutes and you go, yeah, this is just a waste of time. And uh, it's, I think... You can always tell because of the motivation of why it's being made in the first place. Sometimes it's to do with money. Sometimes it's to do with rights, who has ownership or whatever. And you kind of get an understanding as to where it's coming from. But, I mean, these things can't be unseen once seen, and they're, and they're there forever. So, um, I mean, a classic example was the Batman movies of the 1990s. So you started off with, you know, the first Batman movie in 89. You had Batman Returns, both made by Tim Burton. Then all of a sudden they go a completely different direction <laughs> with Batman Forever. Mm. Uh, turned into a pseudo comedy, if you will, and it's like some of that is like, oh my god, it's absolutely painful. And then you get to Batman and Robin, where even George Clooney, you know, that actually freely admitted that um, he'd killed the franchise. And this is like, once again, if you watch the first and or the second movie and get to the fourth movie, you go, where did you, where did this go so wrong? And unfortunately, you know, that that's a badly tarnished brush. And of course, they didn't make another Batman movie for another like fifteen years after that because of the damage that was done. So there's a lot of shark jumping going on with these franchises and you just left this scratch in your head going, what is the deal with that? Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, I mean, those um, third and fourth movies, I mean, uh, we've all got like the Batman collection on Blu-ray or, or DVD, but how often do we pull out numbers three and four and watch? You know, it'll always be the first two. Yeah, it's that just had a completely look, different look and feel and it kind of didn't really work. I mean, there were other franchises that could have, headed down this path. I mean, there's a few people who would think that with the Matrix movies, you only needed the one movie. The one movie was enough. Then all of a sudden, someone has said, oh, no, 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 there was such a big success, we've got to make sequels, and then suddenly a trilogy, and now there's four movies. But uh, uh, Revolutions and Resurrection, no, hang on, this starts with, well, what's it called? <laughs> um, but they start with an R, Matrix R, whatever, two and three. Some of those you're thinking, where are we going with it? I remember the sequence in, uh, I think it was Zion, when they've got this massive party thing going on. Everything's in slow motion, all these writhing bodies and, you know, everybody's sort of like doing this really uh, erotic dancing. And I go, what's this got to do with the damn Matrix? <laughs> Seriously. And it's like, is this really necessary? So I would say to anybody out there regarding Matrix, just watch the first movie and leave it at that. So Because I really think they jumped multiple sharks once they got around to the sequels of those films. And uh, do you remember those, how your response when you first saw them? Absolutely. So my uh, uh, thought about the second movie was just pure disgust. I mean, yeah. you, you, you love the first one um, and to see it fail so badly in the second one, it's like, oh, I just wish I'd, they'd left it at one. But I, I don't think they sort of were doing a George Lucas and had a trilogy in mind. I, I suspect that uh, they had uh, been told by the studio, right, this is a, a license to print money. Just come up with something else and just throw it out there. And, and I think that's maybe the key is if there's no um, idea that they're going to make uh, extra movies, uh, unlike, say, Back to the Future, another example where they knew that they were going to make a trilogy or uh, Lord of the Rings, where, again, sort of they had a, a plan from the outset. Uh, I don't think The Matrix was that sort of plan. No, and I tend to agree with you. I think someone said invent a story, even if there is no story to be invented. And I think that's a, uh, the case with a lot of these things. And you, it is proven that if you've got a trilogy that's written in advance, they tend to do much better than things that have just been made up on the spot. But I do find it funny when they'll jump the shark effectively on the third film and you go, oh, I'm sure the fourth movie will fix everything. And it's just freaking worse. <laughs> At least the fourth movie in Matrix wasn't too bad. And that was only made a handful of years ago. But by then, I think the damage is done and people have moved on. Um, now you were gonna. I know you. For, you were gonna mention a franchise that even I had never thought of, and the movie I thought jumped the shark was not the, actually the movie. It's to do with big green lizards running around destroying buildings. And yeah, because you've got um, Godzilla movies that have been made for years and years and years. So I was really looking at the um, uh, the, the early ones that uh, came out. So. The first movie came out in 1954 and is generally regarded as a, a classic. You know, it's like the Citizen Kane of, of monster movies. But uh, uh, where did things all go wrong? And it unfortunately didn't take too long for them to uh, sort of find themselves uh, in, in deep trouble because uh, we had uh, 
movies coming out in um, 1962, like King Kong versus Godzilla. And, I mean, we didn't need to see King Kong. I mean, it wasn't necessary. But, again, when we're talking about uh, jumping the shark, it's like we're stretched for ideas. What are we going to do? So why not uh, pair together the 1930s American classic monster King Kong with the uh, the 1950s Japanese monster Godzilla? And, I mean, it was all right. Um, it wasn't dreadful, but, you know, there's desperate times uh, right there. And that's literally only, like, eight years after the original movie. And then after that, we did have some other uh, terrible examples just to uh, to keep things uh, going along. Uh, we had, for example, Son of Godzilla. Now, uh, I can see people cringing at the very um, thought of that, uh, and uh, I think we all did when we uh, had to watch it because uh, baby uh, Godzilla was just, mm, yeah, it's like the... Uh, the Ewoks of the monster um, uh, world. So, uh, and and, uh, uh, it literally is because I think it was designed so that uh, it could be a child-friendly monster movie because, I mean, um, uh, mean, kids probably enjoyed it, but uh, uh, the adults were the ones that probably enjoyed the Godzilla movies most, whereas this one uh, said it um, just dumbed things down a bit. And speaking of uh, dumbing things down, uh, we did actually have uh, uh, another one where in 1972, uh, Godzilla vs. Gigan, um, we had Godzilla and, uh, I'm just trying to pronounce the name, Agrigus. The two monsters were actually talking to each other in speech bubbles. I mean, how how, how bad is that? So... um, just, just when you thought that uh, uh, things couldn't get worse, they were actually resorting to that kind of rubbish in 1972. Uh, the other thing we find is that uh, desperate for stories, they'll just pull something out of today's news. So we had things like, um, uh, for example, uh, one of the movies where the, uh, the monster was made up of pollution and environmental waste. So that was Godzilla versus Adora. So again, you know, out of the the topical times, let's make a, a monster out of pollution. Uh, and before that, we had a um, uh, another movie, All Monsters Attack, where it's about uh, uh, a bullied child meeting Godzilla's son, who was also being bullied. So again, sort of social values sort of creeping into uh, movies that didn't really sort of need that kind of thing. So desperate times. Yeah, because when we first brought this up, I thought the movie you're going to say that jumped the shark was the 1999 movie with Matthew Broderick. I actually really enjoyed it, even though I couldn't stand the fact they redesigned the monster to look completely different. And uh, that was about the only downside to it. But the rest of it I thought was actually quite good. It's very funny. You're talking about uh, Godzilla versus King Kong. And, of course, someone obviously thought that was a good idea because they just did redid that a couple of years ago, Godzilla versus King Kong, I think it was what it was called. It was, um, yeah. And, I mean, but that was quite cool. And, of course, regarding the King Kong franchise, I mean, there's no franchise, but if you're going to say, was there one movie that was regarding King Kong that was an outer tribe? That was King Kong Lives from the mid-'80s. Uh, and Linda Hamilton was in that, actually. And if you ever saw that, that was utter garbage. So if ever someone said, oh, there's the original movie in the in the 30s and there's the ones that you're talking about where you paid with Godzilla and they've got the 76 movie and, of course, you've got the Peter Jackson movies and you go, well, was it? and you got one in the middle from the 80s. Don't watch the 80s one. It was utter rubbish. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, and and just, just to throw you off, believe it or not, that movie has actually had an Australian Blu-ray release. Uh, so well, King Kong Lives, really? Yeah, they've re- re- remastered it and uh, it's in my collection. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that you can class is... A possible jumping the shark, and this is a bit of a sensitive one, so we're not going to discuss it, but I know it was brought up at the time, uh, was the Ghostbusters franchise. So you had the first two movies for that. Then you had the 2016 one featuring the all-female Ghostbusters and a lot of people, depending on who you speak to, would say whether it was good or bad. And then, of course, you had Afterlife, which brought back the original characters made a few years later. So if you're going to say, was there a jumping the shark with the Ghostbusters movies, you could potentially argue that the middle one was that. But, um, yeah, that's probably a, a sensitive topic for other podcasters to discuss. Um, and you can argue as to whether things like even the big franchises, like your MCUs and the DC movies, um, have they had their moments where they're sort of struggling and they've kind of cocked up their franchises a bit? 
With MCU post Endgame, there's a possibility you could argue that a couple of the newer movies just haven't really worked and haven't really sort of fit the bill and have sort of like a few people have sort of lost interest in them and sort of disappeared for a while. So nothing, nothing really bad, uh, but uh, they're certainly not as bad as the DC universe. There's a lot of movies in DC that just really irked a lot of people, just hasn't worked. It's almost like they're jumping sharks multiple times with the DC movies. When they do have a success story, it's great and wonderful, but it doesn't happen on a very regular basis. We talk about the modern movies now, and for a period of time it was as if they, they were sabotaging all their own products and, of course, uh, that's not a good way to be. And uh, it could take them years to get back in on uh, on a good basis. So there you go. Jumping Sharks. Yay, team. What do you reckon, eh? It's like Sharknado gone wrong. Yeah, actually, that's a franchise. I wonder if they've jumped their own shark in Sharknado. I, I think their bar was set so low that it's impossible. <laughs> so in my research, I was noticing there was one movie that was considered an absolute classic, and the second movie was so bad that... Uh, I couldn't believe how uh, low it was rated. So, and that one is actually um, uh, Predator. So, on Rotten Tomatoes, the first movie got a, uh, a whopping big eighty-one percent, and then the second one thirty percent. So, basically, in 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 the ranks, we went from being the uh, the number one uh, Predator movie to the number four in the uh, the list. So, talk about uh, uh, going from uh, one extreme to the other. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that. Sure, Predator 2 was not as good as Predator, but it's certainly not as bad as Predator Requiem. Uh, just to give you an idea, Predator uh, Requiem, 12%. Yeah, there's something to be said about that. Predator 2 wasn't that bad. I did actually have a scenario recently where uh, a few of us were talking about it because one person that we were speaking to uh, was sort of raving about Predator 2, and then someone else went back and watched it and go, you know what, it wasn't as bad as what we first thought it was. So like a lot of shows... There are some movies where when they first come out, they get bagged really badly and you go, you know what, you've jumped sharks left, right and centre, they're complete rubbish. But you wait a few decades and you watch them again and you go, you know what, it wasn't as bad as what I remembered it to be. It's actually quite good. It's quite acceptable. But there are some, no, no amount of time, a thousand years from now, they're still going to be out of shit. So <laughs> no one's ever going to fix that. Not looking at Superman 4, Batman and Robin, Alien Resurrection and and, and so on and so on. So uh you know, you know that it killed the uh, franchise because uh, Predator came out in '87, Predator Two in 1990, and the next one didn't come out for another uh, 14 years in 2004. So that's how it and, killed it. And how did it go? <laughs> how did it go in 2004? Not very well. No, 22 percent. There you go. Very, very cool. Anyway, that's us. That's it for us for this particular week. Hope you've enjoyed our uh, natterings and gurglings. As always, don't forget to check out the uh, Sci-Fi Zone. Um, sort of the socials on the YouTube and the Instagrams and whatever else. And as per our uh, letters of comment earlier, you can actually contact us and leave a letter of comment, which we will address on this particular show. You can either contact us through the Facebook page, that's the Sci-Fi Zone Facebook page, or even leave a comment on YouTube. But uh, be sure to pass on some things for us to look at and address, and we will do so accordingly. And don't forget to check out the Jeffro page. Just Google it. It should be the first thing that pops up. <laughs> And with that in mind, we're going to party hard rock on. We'll see you all next week. And uh, as always, make sure you stay nerdy. Cheers.